Hello, and welcome to Chapter 41, Terrorism Response and Disaster Management of Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, 12th edition. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will be able to describe what constitutes terrorism and the EMT's response to terrorism, and you will be able to apply this knowledge. Additionally, you will be able to demonstrate an understanding of weapons of mass destruction, agents, and countermeasures, as well as a fundamental knowledge of disaster management safety. Okay, so let's get started. It is possible that you may be called on to respond to a terrorist event during your career. The question is not, will terrorists strike again? but rather when and where they will strike. You must be mentally and physically prepared for the possibility of a terrorist event. It is difficult to plan and anticipate a response to many terrorist events, yet there are several key principles that apply to every response. So let's start off with what is terrorism? Terrorist forces have been at work since early civilizations. The U.S. Department of Justice defines both international terrorism and domestic terrorism with these points. They involve violent acts or acts dangerous to human life that violate federal or state law. And they appear to be intended to in intimidate or coerce a civilian population, to influence the policy of a government by intimidating or coercion, or to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping. One difference between the two is location. Okay, so international terrorism occurs primarily outside the, the jurisdiction of the United States, and domestic terrorism occurs primarily within the jurisdiction of the United States. Modern day terrorism is common in the Middle East where terrorist groups frequently attack civilian populations. In the United States, domestic terrorists have carried out multiple attacks. Only a small prevent percentage of groups actually turn towards terrorism as a means to achieve their goals. So religious extremist groups or doomsday cults are example of terrorism and extremist political groups, they include violent supremacist groups and those who seek political, religious, economic, and social freedoms. Also cyber terrorists and single issue groups. Next, we're gonna talk about active shooter events and an alarming new trend in domestic terrorism involves the concept of a lone wolf terrorist attack. This has become a frequent threat in the United States. The National Security Critical Issue Task Force defines lone wolf terrorism as the deliberate creation and exploitation of fear through violence or threat of violence by a single actor who pursues political change linked to a formulative ideology, whether his own or that of a large organization, and who does not receive orders, direction, or material support from outside sources. The motives of a lone wolf terrorist are not always clear. Attacks may be targeted at schools, music festivals, or shopping centers and are difficult to predict. Many lone wolf terrorist attacks involve firearms and not explosives. This type of event is classified as an active shooter event. These attacks are, have prompted discussion of gun laws, mental health, and education of the public and first responders on how to treat the casualties of active shooter events. The Hartford Consensus recommends that a response plan for active shooter response should include the acronym THREAT. And THREAT stands for, the T is threat suppression, Hemorrhage control is the H, R, rapid extrication to safety, A is assessment by medical providers, and finally, transport to definitive care. 
EMS crews may be equipped with ballistic vests and helmets so that they can potentially be prepared with law enforcement to assist with threat and evacuation of injured people from the active scene. A key component to safely incorporating EMS crews with law enforcement teams who are moving forward into an active shooter scene is interagency training. Next, we're going to talk about weapons of mass destruction. So a weapon of mass destruction or a WMD or a weapon of mass casualty, a WMC, is any agent designed to bring about mass death casualties or massive damage to property and infrastructure, such as a bridge, a bridges or tunnels, airports or, and or seaports. We use the acronym Be Nice or C B R N E, and these are mnemonics to remember the kinds of weapons of mass destruction. Okay, so Be Nice is biologic, nuclear, incendiary, chemical, and explosive. And then the C B R N E is chemical, biologic, radiologic, nuclear, and explosive. To date, the preferred weapons of mass destruction for terrorists have been explosives. Weapons of mass destruction are relatively easy to obtain or create and are specifically geared towards killing large numbers of people. Chemical terrorism warfare. So chemical agents are manufactured substances that can have devastating effects on living organisms. They can be produced in liquid, powder, or vapor form depending on the desired route and of exposure and dissemination technique. So these agents consist of the following type. So we have first vesicants. These are blister agents. Next are respiratory agents, and those are choking agents. Nerve agents, and then metabolic agents, so cyanines. So let's talk about biologic ter terrorism and warfare a little bit more. So biologic agents are organisms that can cause disease. They're generally found in nature for terrorist use. However, they can be cultivated, synthesized, and mutated in a laboratory. So weaponization of a biologic agent is performed to artificially maximize the target population's exposure to the germ. So the primary types are viruses, they can be bacteria or toxins. Next, I, we're going to talk about nuclear or radiologic terrorism. So there have been only two publicly known incidents involving the use of a nuclear device, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It is possible for a terrorist to secure radioactive material or waste to um, use one of these as a, an act of terror. So these materials are far easier for a determined terrorist to acquire and require less expertise to use. They're called dirty bombs and they can be, they can cause widespread panic and civil disturbances. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the different types of terrorisms, uh, and so now we're going to talk about EMT response to this. So the basic foundation of patient care remain the same. The treatment can and will vary slightly. So always remember situational awareness and recognize a terrorist event or indicators. So the planning of most acts of terror is covert, which means that the public safety community generally has no prior knowledge of the time, location, or nature of the attack. So you must be constantly aware of your surroundings and understand the possible risks for terrorism. You must know the current threat level issued by the government through the Department of Homeland Security, or DHS. On April 2011, the color-coded Homeland Security Advisory System was, placed by, was replaced by the National Terrorism Advisory System, or NTAS. This alerts from the NTAS contain a summary of the threat and actions that first responders, government agencies, and the public can take to maintain safety. 
make sure you are aware of the information sent out by that advisory system at the start of your workday. So on every call, make the following observations. And this is what we mean by the situational awareness. So what type of call are you responding to? Where's the location? What are the number of patients? Do you, um, what about the victim statements or any pre-incident indicators? All right, so when we respond, we have to remember scene safety. And remember to stage your vehicle a safe distance from this incident. We need to wait for law enforcement personnel to advise us if the scene has been secured. So if you have any doubt that it may not be safe, do not enter. The best location for staging is upwind and uphill from the incident. And remember the following rules. So we're going to uh, failure to park your vehicle at a safe location can place you and your partner in danger. If your vehicle is blocked by another emergency vehicle or damaged by a secondary device, you will be unable to provide victims with transportation or escape yourself. All right, so let's talk about a secondary device. And this is an additional explosive that are set to explode after the initial bomb. It's intended primarily to injure those responders and to secure immediate coverage. May include various types of electronic equipment, such as cell phones or pagers. And so the figure on this slide shows an example of the safely staging an ambulance. All right, so responder safety or personal protective equipment when we're responding. So the best form of protection from a weapons of mass destruction is preventing yourself from even coming in contact with that agent. The greatest threats are contamination and cross-contamination. So what we wanna do is as soon as we realize there's a terrorist attack, we need to make those notification procedures. We have to notify the dispatcher when we suspect that terrorist attack or a weapons of mass destruction. And what we're gonna tell dispatch is the nature of the event, any additional resources that we need, and the estimated number of patients, the upwind route of approach or an additional um, or optimal approach. It is important to establish a staging area. And this is where other units are going to converge. Train responders and the proper protective equipment are the only people um, to handle the weapons of mass destruction event, okay? So keep in mind that there may be more than one event or one device. Next, we need to establish command. So as the first provider on scene, the EMT may need to establish command until additional personnel arrive. You and other EMTs may function as a medical branch, triage supervisor, treatment supervisor, transport supervisor, logistic officers, or command and general staff. And if the incident command system is already in place, immediately seek out the medical staging officer to receive your assignment. Okay. So then we need to reassess scene safety. We're constantly assessing and reassessing scene safety, important component of situational awareness. All right, so if there's chemical agents, such as liquid or gases that are dispersed to kill or injure, the characteristics of, of an agent can be described as liquid, gas, or solid material. And it could be persistent or non-volatile agent and it can remain on the surface for long periods of time, usually longer than 24 hours. A non-persistent or volatile agents evaporate quickly when left on the surface in an optimal temperature range. Okay, so persistent stays for longer than 24 hours sometimes, and non-persistent agents can evaporate almost immediately. So routes of exposure is how is how the agent most effectively enters the body, okay? So agents with a vapor hazard, those are gonna enter the body through the respiratory tract. And agents with a contact hazard, of course, you get they give off very little vapor or no vapors and they enter the body through the skin. Okay, 
Next, we're going to talk about vesicants. So vesicants are blister agents. The primary route of exposure of blister agents or vesicants is skin. So that's a skin contact. However, if vesicants are left on the skin or clothing too long, they produce vapors that can enter in through the respiratory tract. This can cause burn-like blisters to form on the victim skin and in the respiratory tract. And the agents can consist of, so we could have um, sulfur, sulfur mustard, uh, leucite, or phosgene uh, gases. The vesicant usually can uh, cause the most damage to damp or moist areas of the body, such as armpits, groin, or respiratory tract. Signs of vesicants exposure on the skin include the following. So you're going to have skin irritation, burning, and reddening, immediate intense skin pain, formation of large blisters, or a gray discoloration of the skin, swollen and closed or irritated eyes, permanent eye injury, including blindness, and uh, signs and symptoms of vapors, uh, if they're inhaled, they could cause hoarseness and strider or severe cough or hematosis or severe dyspnea. All right, so let's go through these vesicants. Sulfur mustard is a brown yellow oily substance that is generally considered very persistent. Okay, so it stays around a long time. As the agent is absorbed into the skin, it begins an irreversible process of damage to our cells. So this mustard is considered a mutagen, and which means that it mutates, it changes and causes the structure, changes the structure of cells. The patient will experience a progressive reddening of that area, which will generally develop large blisters. So mustard also attacks vulnerable cells within the bone marrow and depletes the body's ability to reproduce white cells. So sulfur mustard vapors can be inhaled, creating upper and lower airway compromise. Okay, leucocyte and phosgene gas produce blister wounds very similar to those caused by mustard. They produce immediate intense pain and discomfort when contact is made. The patient may have a gray discoloration at the contaminated site. So vesicant treatment. So how are we going to treat these? Um, there are no antibodies for mustard or CX exposure. So British um, anti-leucite um, is an antidote for Agent L. Ensure that the patient has been deconned before you initiate any treatment. If agency has been inhaled, uh, the patient may require prompt airway support. So soon as decon is complete, generally burn centers are the best equipped to handle wounds and, and subsequent infections from these vesicants. All right, so pulmonary agents, and these are choking agents and um, gases that can immediately harm or harm a person if when they're exposed to them. So this includes chlorine and phosgene, and they produce respiratory-related symptoms such as dyspnea and uh, tachypnea. The role of exposure is through the respiratory tract which makes them an inhalin and a vapor hazard. So place inside the lungs, they damage the lung tissue and fluid leaks into the lungs. Pulmonary edema develops and this results in difficulty breathing because of the severely impaired gas exchange. Right, so let's talk about chlorine. Uh, chlorine was the first chemical agent ever used in warfare. It has a distinct odor of bleach and creates a green haze. So initially it produces upper airway irritation and a choking sensation. The signs and symptoms are shortness of breath, tightness in the chest, hoarseness and strider, and gasp gasping and coughing. With serious exposure, patients may experience pulmonary edema and complete airway obstruction or even death. Next, we're going to talk about phosgene. So phosgene has been produced in chemical warfare and is a product of the combustion such as might be produced in a fire. OK, 
Okay, so it's a very potent agent that has developed a, a delayed onset of symptoms, usually hours. The odor produced by the chemical is similar to that of freshly mown grass or hay. All right, so phosgene is sm smells like freshly mown grass or hay. Okay, the chlorine, chlorine smells like what did we say? Chlorine smelt like chlorine smelt like um, bleach and it's green haze. Okay, so back to phosgene. Um, the result is that much more of a the gas may enter the body unnoticed. Okay, so initially a mild exposure may include the signs and symptoms of nausea, chest tightness, severe coughs, dyspnea on exertion, and pulmonary edema may be severe that the patient continues to cough up white or pink tinged fluid. Okay, and so a severe exposure produces large amounts of fluid in the lungs that may, um, that's going to cause the patient um, to be eventually become hypovolemic and then of course hypotension tensive all right so pulmonary agent treatment that's what we're just been discussing is that pulmonary agent so we want to remove the patient from that atmosphere and we need to do aggressive management of the abcs okay so do not allow the patient to be active um, we want them to rest and there are no antidotes to counteract pulmonary agents so primary goals are to perform ABCs, allow the patient to rest in a position of comfort with the head elevated and initiate rapid transport. If the patient's condition does not improve with basic airway support, we need to consider requesting our advanced life support intercept. And continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP may benefit some patients. Others will require advanced airway management. All right, so now let's talk about nerve agents. So nerve agents are among the most deadly um, chemicals developed, and they're classified as weapons of mass destruction. They're not readily available to the general public. They're extremely toxic and rapidly fatal with any route of exposure. So weapons of mass destruction can cause cardiac arrest within seconds to minutes after exposure. A class of chemical agents are organophosphates. These are the nerve agents, which are found in household bug sprays, agricultural pesticides, and some industrial chemicals at much higher or lower strengths than a weaponized form. So organophosphates, what they do is they block an essential enzyme in the nervous system, and it causes the body's organs to become overstimulated and burn out. And so that what they do, so we're going to talk about some of the organophosphates, okay? Um, so first we have or, um, the G agents, and they came from the early nerve agents, the G series, okay? So we have sarin. Sarin is a GB and is highly volatile. It's colorless and odorless, okay? And basically... Um, the standard measurement that represents the amount that would kill 50% of the population exposed to this level, it's about one drop, okay? So especially dangerous in enclosed environments, when it comes into contact with the skin, it's quickly absorbed and then evaporates. So when it's on the clothing, it has the effect of off-gassing, right? So that was sarin. Now we have salmon. So S-O-M-A-N, that's a G agent. It's a G-D agent, okay? And it's twice as persistent as sarin and five times more lethal. So S-O-M-A-N, somen, it has a fruity odor and generally has no color. This agent is in contact and an inhalation hazard, okay? So the next agent we're going to talk about is tubun. So it's a GA agent, T-A-B-U-M, Tuban, and it's approximately half as lethal as sarin and 36 times more persistent, okay? So it stays around a very long time. This is another one that has a fruity smell and an appearance similar to sarin. It is a contact inhalation hazard. Next, we have a V agent. VX is what you'll see, how you'll see it written. And it's clear, oily agent that has no color and looks like baby oil. It is 
more than 100 times more lethal than sarin and extremely persistent. It is usually absorbed into the skin and the oily residue remains in extremely difficult to decontaminate. So this is going to show you guys, um, the, this uh, table shows the slide of um, which compares nerve agents. And so you could see the names of those agents on the left side and then um, the comparison of the, the different types of special features, the onset, volatility, and the exposures, okay? All right, so nerve agents are produce similar symptoms but have varying routes of entry. So symptoms are um, described using the military mnemonic sludge M. Okay. Or you could use the medical mnemonic dumbbells, and that's um, what we use, okay? All right. And so, um, basically, how you treat these is you're going to use a duodote auto-injector, okay? And so, let's talk a little bit more about um, what, the, what these nerve agents do. So, they cause meiosis, and it's most common symptom of a nerve agent exposure and can remain for days and weeks. And so what happens is um, seen quickly in vapor exposure and may occur after an isolated skin exposure. And so the patient may have some form of exposure to both sometimes. So seizures can continue until the patient dies or until treatment is given with an antidote kit. And that's that duodote auto-injector, okay? So nerve agent treatments. So you can greatly increase the number of chances of survivability by providing O2 and ventilatory um, support. So I want to talk about the duodote auto-injector. And what that is, it contains 2.1 milligrams of atropine and 600 milligrams of paloxidine chloride. And that it's called 2-PAM. So 600 milligrams of 2-PAM. All right, so now we're going to talk about metabolic agents, and these are cyanides. Cyanides are um, metabolic agents, okay? Hydrogen cyanide and cyanide chlorine affect the body's ability to use oxygen. And so cyanide is a colorless gas with an odor similar to almonds, okay? So when you see almonds, think of cyanide. All right, so effects of cyanide begin on the cellular level and are very rapidly seen in the organ and system levels. They're commonly found in many industrial settings such as gold and silver mining, photography, and plastic processing, and often present in fires associated with textile and plastic factories. So in low doses, these chemicals are associated with dizziness, lightheadedness, headache, and vomiting. Okay. All right, so high doses will produce symptoms, which include shortness of breath, respiratory distress, tachypnea, flush skin, and tachycardia. Alter mental status, seizures, coma, apnea, and cardiac arrest. So cyanide, how do we treat cyanide exposures, okay? So all of the patient's clothes must be removed. And this presents off-gassing in the ambulance. So we want to decontaminate any patients who may have been exposed to liquid contamination prior to initiating treatment. Of course, we have to support the ABCs. Okay, so now we're going to talk about biologic agents. Okay, so biologic agents pose many difficult issues when used as a weapons of mass destruction. Biologic agents can be almost completely undetectable, and most disease causing by these agents will be similar to that of a minor illness. So biologic agents are grouped as viruses, bacteria, and neurotoxins, and may be spread in various ways. So dissemination is the means by which the terrorists will spread the agent, okay? So a disease vector is an animal that, once infected, spreads that disease to another animal. How easily the disease can spread from one human to another human is called communicability. communicability. In instance, when communicability is high, such as smallpox, the person is considered contagious. So incubation is the period of time between the person becoming exposed to the agent and the appearance of the first symptoms. 
All right. So the first one we're going to talk about is virus. Viruses. It seems we're living this right now. So germs that require a living host to multiply and survive. And once in the body, the virus invades healthy cells, replicates itself, and spreads throughout the host. So it moves from host to host by direct methods such as respiratory droplets and through vectors. And some viral agents do have vaccines. However, there are not often treatment for viral infections. All right. And so we're going to talk about smallpox. So smallpox, it's highly contagious. All forms of standard precaution must be used to prevent cross-contamination. We want to wear exam gloves, HEPA filters, and eye protection. And before the rash and blisters show, the illness will start with high fever, body aches, and headaches. And it's easily uh, easy, quick way to differentiate between smallpox rash and other skin disorders is to observe the size, shape, and location of these lesions, okay? So in smallpox, all the lesions are going to be identical in their, de in their development, okay? They're small blisters, and they begin on the face and extremities and eventually grow towards the chest and abdomen. That's smallpox. The disease is in its most contagious phase when the blisters begin to form. Here's a table, and on this table, it shows a list of uh, characteristics of smallpox. Okay, then we have VHF, so viral hemorrhagic fevers. And this group of diseases causes, it's caused by viruses, and it includes Ebola, Rift Valley, Merberg, and yellow fever viruses, among others. So it causes the blood in the body to seep out of the tissues and blood vessels. Eventually, the patients will have flu-like symptoms progress to more serious symptoms such as internal and external hemorrhaging. All standard precautions must be taken uh, when treating this illness. Okay, so on this table, uh, it shows a slide of characteristics of viral hemorrhagic fevers, VHF. And then next, we're going to have the bacteria. So bacteria, they do not require a host to multiply and live. The uh, bacteria are complex and larger and can grow up to 100 times larger than a virus. So bacteria infections can be fought with antibiotics, but most bacteria infections are, will generally become uh, flu-like symptoms. Okay, so inhalation or cutaneous anthrax, okay? So this is caused by deadly bacteria that lays dormant in a spur, spore. And when exposed to uh, at the optimal temperature and moisture, the germ will be released from the spore. So the routes of our inhalation, cutaneous, and GI. And the inhalation form or pulmonary anthrax is the deadliest and often persists as a um, severe cold. And then pulmonary anthrax is associated with about 90% death rate if it's not treated. Antibiotics can be used to treat anthrax successfully, and a vaccine is available. And this table on the slide is going to show you some characteristics of anthrax. All right, now we have the plague, and uh, you have a bubonic plague or um, pneumonic plague. Okay, so the plague's natural vectors are infected, uh, usually rodents and fleas, and the bubonic plague infects the lymphatic system. Okay, so the patient's lymph nodes become infected and they grow, and um, the glands of the nodes become large and round, forming um, big, huge, um, large, round lymph nodes. And if you're untreated, the infection may spread through the body, leading to sepsis and then death. So pneumonic plague, though, it's a lung infection. And so it's also um, plague, uh, also known as plague pneumonia, that results from inhalation of that plague bacteria. This form of disease is contagious and has much higher death rate than the bubonic form. Okay. All right, and so this figure slide shows the plague um, swollen lymph nodes, and so that bubo at the lymph under the underarm, and then a plague bubo at the lymph node in the neck. The table on this slide shows characteristics of the plague. 
Okay, so botulinum toxin, this is the most po potent neurotoxin, and it's uh, botulinum, in which it's produced by bacteria. So when introduced into the body, this neurotoxin affects the nervous system's ability to function. And so the voluntary muscle diminishes as the toxin spreads. Eventually, the toxin causes muscle paralysis, leading to respiratory arrest. Okay, so this table on the slide lists the characteristics of the botulinum toxin. Next we have of the neurotoxins is ricin. So this is derived from mash that is left from the castor bean. Okay, so it causes pulmonary edema, respiratory and circulatory failure, which leads to death. It's quite stable and extremely toxic by many routes of exposure, including inhalation. Signs and symptoms of ricin ingestion is fever, chills, headache, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, severe abdominal cramping, dehydration, gastrointestinal bleeding, necrosis of the liver, spleen, kidneys, and GI tract. So signs and symptoms of ricin inhalation are fever, chills, nausea, uh, local irritation of the eyes, nose and throat, sweating, headache, muscle aches, productive cough, chest pain, dyspnea, pulmonary edema, severe lung infection, cyanosis, seizures, and respiratory failure. Okay? Yikes. And this table on the slide lists the characteristics of ricin. Okay. So other EMT roles. So you could be doing syndromic surveillance. And so what this is, is you might be called to monitor the patients presenting in an emergency department and alternate care facilities. You may need to record um, EMS call volume. So it may also be for monitoring the use of over-the-counter medicines, okay? So patients with signs and symptoms that resemble influenza are particularly important. Quality measurement and dispatch operations need to be aware of the un unusual number of calls from patient and unexplainable symptom clusters uh, coming from the particular region or community. So points of disrupt disruption. So this is this strategic national stockpile and they have, it's a POD a distribution, sorry. So an existing facilities that are established in a time of need for mass disrupt distribution of antibiotics, antidotes, vaccines, and other medical and supplies. So medications and supplies. So these medications can be released in deliveries called pushbacks by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention Strategic National Stockpile. So these push packages have a delivery time of about 12 hours wherever um, or anywhere in the country. So EMTs, AMTs, and paramedics may be called upon to assist in delivery of medications to the public. Your role may include triage, treatment, and transport. All right, so what is radiation? Does anybody know? And it's a ionizing radiation is emitted, emitted from uh, uh, rays or particles. It's in, in the form of rays, okay? So this energy can be found in radioactive material such as rocks or, and or metals. So radioactive material is any material that emits radiation. This material is unstable. And it attempts to stabilize itself by changing its structure in a natural process called decay. So the energy that is emitted from a strong radiologic source is alpha, beta, gamma, or neutron radiation. Okay. Alpha is the least harmful penetrating type and cannot move through most objects. Beta radiation is slightly more penetrating than alpha and requires a lay layer of clothing to stop it. Then you have gamma rays, and they're far faster and stronger than alpha and beta rays. These rays can easily penetrate through the human body and require lead or several inches of concrete to prevent penetration. And then you have those neutron particles, and those are among the most powerful forms of radiation. So neutrons easily penetrate through lead and require several feet of concrete to stop them. This figure on the slide shows um, what can deflect the four types of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, and neutron.
Okay, so sources of this radiological material include, and they're generally used for purposes that benefit humankind, such as medicine or killing germs or construction. And once radiologic material has been used for that purpose, the material remaining in the radiologic is waste. And so these materials can be found in hospitals, healthcare facilities, colleges and un or universities, uh, north power plants or nuclear power plants, and chemical and industrial sites. All right, so RDDs, these are radiologic dispersal devices. And so any container that is designed to disperse radioactive material, all right? So a dirty bomb carries the potential to injure victims with not only the radioactive material, but also the explosion material used to deliver it, okay? The explosive material. And so the destruction capability of a dirty bomb is limited to the explosives that are attached to it. So the dirty bomb is an ineffective WMD. All right, then you have nuclear energy. So artificially made by altering or splitting radioactive atoms, they, the result is an immense amount of energy that usually takes a form of heat. And so nuclear material is used when uh, in medicines, weapons, naval vessels, and power plants. And nuclear material gives off all forms of radiation, including neutrons. All right. So nuclear weapons keep only, the, they're kept only in secure facilities around the world. The likelihood of a nuclear attack is extremely remote. And since the cause of the formal, the collapse of the formal Soviet Union, the whereabouts of many small nuclear devices are still unknown though, okay? So these small suitcase sized nuclear weapons are called special atomic demolition mutants or SADM SADMs, <laughs> these are uh, believed to be missing. All right, so symptomology. So patients exposed to known or suspected source of excessive radiation are considered victims of acute radiation toxicity. The effect of radiation exposure will vary depending on the amount of radiation and to that person and the route of entry. So radiation can be introduced to the body by all routes of entry as well as through the through the body. So e-radiation. Right, and so this table on the slide lists the common uh, signs of acute radiation toxicity. So how are we gonna manage it? So being exposed to a radiation source does not make a patient contaminated or radioactive. However, when the patients have a radioactive, radioactive source on their body, they are contaminated and must be initially cared for by a hazmat responder. So once a person is deconned, you may be able to treat them, and you're going to start with the ABCs, and treat the patient for any burns or trauma. We have to wear appropriate pre-PE, and we're going to secure plastic bags with body fluids obtained from the patient. Place all body fluids and containers and properly dispose of them with other potentially radioactive waste. Okay, protective measures. We're going to, um, there are no good suits um, or protective gear designed to completely shield from radiation. But the best way to protect yourself from the effects of the radiation is time, distance, and shielding. All right, so explosive devices we're going to talk about next, and these are incendiary devices, and they are weapons used to start fires. Terrorists use the flamethrowers, chemicals, multi cocktails, and other explosive devices. So it's important for you to be able to identify the objects you've become, um, or you, and any object you believe is a potential device. Notify the proper authorities and safely evacuate the area. So remember that there are possibility of secondary devices when you are responding to the scene. All right, so mechanisms of injury. The type of injury of wounds primarily depend on the patient's distance from the epicenter of the explosion. So blast explosions are usually occur in a number of ways. So we have a primary blast and a secondary blast. So the primary blast is due solely to the direct effects of the pressure on the body. 
the injury is seen almost exclusive in the hollow organs. And then the secondary you have, and that persists of non-penetrated injury, and it results from being struck by flying debris. So objects are propelled by force um, and bl of the blast and strike the victim, causing injury. Okay. And then you have tertiary. So we talked about primary, secondary blast, now tertiary blast, okay? And this results from the whole body displacement and the impact with the environment. And so other indirect effects include crush injury or because of the collapse of a structure. And then we have the quad quadrinary blast, so the number four blast injury, and uh, any other injury caused by the blast, including toxic inhalation of that gas, burns, medical emergency, sustained while fleeing the scene of an explosion. So even metal, a mental health disorder that develops immediately after or days to weeks after the, that detonation of the explosive device. So what happens with the physics of that explosion? All right, so when the substance is detonated, a solid or liquid uh, chemical is converted into large volumes of gas under pressure, which results in explosive energy release. This generates a pressure wave in the shape of a basically a spherical blast wave. And it extends in all directions from the point of explosion. So flying debris and high winds commonly cause conventional blunt and penetrating traumas. So... But tissues are at risk when we have these explosive devices, and so the hollow organs, such as the middle ear or lungs or GI tract, are susceptible to pressure changes. The junction between these tissues of very different densities and exposed tissues, such as head, neck, are prone to injury as well. So the ear is an organ um, that is sensory, sensitive to blast injuries and potatoes. The patient may report tingling or pain in the ears or some type of uh, hearing loss. Primary blast injuries occur as contusions and hemorrhages, and solid organs are relatively protected from the shock wave, but may be injured by a secondary missile. Okay? And hollow organs may be injured by similar mechanisms as lung tissue. Petechiae to large um, hematomas are the most visible sign. And according to the CDC, blast lung is the most common cause of death, okay? So neurologic injuries and head trauma are also common, causes a fatal uh, fatality from the blast injury, all right? So extremity injuries include traumatic amputations are also common, and patients may die of massive hemorrhage without the rapid um, application of a tourniquet. Okay, so uh, that concludes the lecture portion. Now we're going to do a little bit of a review questions, okay? So let's see how much we've learned. What type of terrorist group would most likely bomb an abortion clinic? All right, so what did we learn? We know that this is a domestic terrorist uh, um, attack, and we're going to say it's a single incident terrorist attack. The term weaponization is defined as, right? So is it a method? Is it a period of time? Is it a cultivation or synthesization of mutant, uh, mutation of an agent, let's see, or the detonation of an explosive item? Hmm, what do we think? So we're gonna say weaponization is a creation of a weapon from a biologic event or agent generally found in the nature that causes disease. All right, so that was C, and that's the correct answer. Okay, the Department of Homeland Security posts a daily advisory system to help the public aware of the current terrorist level. So what does orange indicate? We didn't really talk much about the colors, but let's see. What does orange indicate? What do you guys think? I bet it is. It's B. So B, the orange color indicates a high risk of terrorists. The red is the highest. All right, so we're dispatched to bomb along with 15 other ambulances. On our arrival, where should we uh, stage the ambulance? And we know we want to be upwind and uphill, right? So we always want to be upwind. Oh, nope, downwind. We want the hazmat. We want to make sure that we're upwind from the and uphill. Yep, upwind, uphill. 
All right, so that is the answer, B, upwind uphill. All right, a terrorist would most likely use a secondary explosive device. Why do they use this? Why would they use this? I bet it's to injure the rescuers and to gain that maximum public attention. And we were right. Yep, secondary is to get the rescue workers and to get caught on camera. All right, so when assessing a patient who was exposed to a vesicant agent, uh-oh, we should expect to encounter, I bet, some blistering. Blistering, yep, primary exposure route of vesicants, um, also called blister agents, is the skin. Okay, All right, number seven, what does sulfur mustard do to those cells? Does it make it retain water? Does it cause it to release? Does it cause it to mutate? Or does it cause all the fluids and it causes severe high dehydration? What do you guys think? And it's C, so it also it causes cells to mutate. Pinpoint pupils, vomiting, bradycardia, and excessive salivation are signs of. What do you guys think they're signs of? I bet you it is uh, the GD nerve agent. So uh, this is going to cause death within seconds, and it's you can use the pneumonic dumbbells. All right. You respond to a plastic factory where numerous people present with shortness of breath, flush skin, and altered mental status. One of the patients tells you he smelled almonds. Uh-oh. What do we know about almonds? Right away, cyanide, right? So cyanide is that almond smell. Very good. Okay, factors that have the greatest impact on the severity of radiation exposure include, what do you think? I think it's time, distance, and shielding, you think? Yep, the best way to protect yourself um, is time, distance, and shielding. So we want to uh, reduce the time, increase the distance, and the shielding, okay? All right, so this concludes Chapter 41 Lecture. If you enjoyed this lecture, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and like it. And we're going to uh, and stand by for uh, multiple more lectures. I will be producing the 41 chapters of this book. Okay. All right. And thank you.